In this final video of our unit on spectroscopy, we're going to talk about putting it all together to determine the structure of an unknown organic sample from spectral data. The information at our disposal to do this includes the molecular formula, the mass spectrum, carbon-13 NMR, an infrared spectrum, and a proton NMR spectrum. And one point that I want to make on this slide is that you'll need to use all of this information simultaneously to solve a structure rigorously. No single spectrum is going to be enough to completely determine the structure of an organic molecule because all of these results are interdependent on some level and each spectrum only gives you a partial amount of information in terms of structure. So for example, while proton NMR might give us the most information about connectivity, it can't tell us everything. It can't tell us, for example, the functional groups in the molecule in a highly rigorous way that gives us a lot of confidence. Experts at structure determination are able to hold different bits and pieces of information from different spectra in their minds or on the page and synthesize it all to propose a structure for the sample. This is going to require taking really good notes as you solve spectra and looking for resonances across different spectra, situations where two different spectral methods are telling you the same thing, for example, pointing to the same functional group or the same connectivity. While it is extremely important to stay flexible as you determine structure in these spectral problems, there is a flow for structure determination suggested by the type of information available from each type of method. Generally, the first place you want to start is with the mass spectrum. And if the molecular formula is not provided, use either high-resolution mass spectrometry. And the idea of high-resolution mass spec is that the method is sensitive enough that we can tell the difference between atoms or groups with the same mass in a coarse sense. For example, if you think about CH2, which has a mass of 12, this is the same as the mass of a nitrogen atom which makes it a little bit difficult to distinguish between these just using, for example, molecular ion peak mass. But high resolution mass spec can do this. And isotopic abundances can also be useful for this in determining, for example, the number of chlorine or bromine atoms in the formula. Once you have the formula, you should actually move away from the spectra for a second and calculate what, what are called the degrees of unsaturation based on the formula. Degrees of unsaturation is based on the idea that every multiple bond or ring that we find within a structure means that we've subtracted two hydrogens from the alkane formula based on the number of carbons that are present. So for example, looking at this formula, we would expect the C13 alkane to contain 28 hydrogens, 2n plus 2, where n is the number of carbons. Each multiple bond or ring within the structure takes away two hydrogens, and so the difference between the alkane number of hydrogens and the actual number in the formula tells us how many units of unsaturation or multiple bonds or rings are really what we're referring to here as a unit of unsaturation we find in the formula. Just to formalize this, we can say that the degrees of unsaturation is equal to the number of hydrogens in the saturated alkane, that is the linear acyclic alkane, minus the number of hydrogens in the molecular formula divided by two. Though it's not directly relevant here, it is important to consider the effects of heteroatoms for each halogen in the structure, which I'm just going to call X. We subtract one unit since halogen replaces a hydrogen in the structure. And for each nitrogen in the structure, we add one unit in this numerator since nitrogen is bound to two hydrogens. So the addition of a nitrogen atom adds the capacity to hold one more hydrogen. Oxygen actually does nothing since oxygen is bound to one hydrogen, for example, in an alcohol, it doesn't add the ability for the structure to hold more hydrogens than the saturated alkane. And so based on this given molecular formula and our formula for degrees of unsaturation that we've laid out here, the degrees of unsaturation in this molecule are five. This means we have five multiple bonds or rings within the structure. And this is actually quite large for a molecule containing only 13 carbons. We're going to either have multiple triple bonds. Here a triple bond counts as two since each multiple bond, the double and the triple, removes two hydrogens. Or we might be looking at a ring structure with double bonds within it where again those count separately. For example a benzene ring is very highly unsaturated. It counts for one unit due to the ring plus three due to the double bonds or a total of four. And so it's likely that the structure in question here is going to contain a benzene ring to account for these degrees of unsaturation, and there may, for example, be 
a multiple bond somewhere in there. And notably, this doesn't necessarily have to be a carbon-carbon double bond. Any multiple bond in the structure is going to count as one degree of unsaturation. And so while this is an easy step to skip over, it's important not to skip it. It does actually give us some structural insights. With the degrees of unsaturation this high, it's looking very likely that the final structure is going to contain a benzene ring. And this can start to orient our thinking as we look, for example, at the infrared spectrum and at the proton NMR. We should start looking for aromatic protons. From here, where you should really go next is identifying functional groups using primarily the infrared and carbon-13 NMR spectra and using the proton NMR spectrum to confirm where needed. The main advantage of the proton NMR spectrum is that it gives us insight into the specific alkyl chains found within the structure from coupling and integration. For example, looking at this infrared spectrum, we can immediately gravitate toward this massive peak near 1700, which points to the CO double bond. There's one of our degrees of unsaturation, the carbonyl group. We also find CH stretches out past 3000, which is going to be highly suggestive of aromatic protons based on the degrees of unsaturation and the fact that the carbons here are likely sp2 hybridized because of the frequency of the vibration. It's also possible, although quite a bit more ambiguous, to identify some of the CC stretches of the aromatic in the fingerprint region here. The proton NMR spectrum should reinforce the functional group information we have from the infrared and carbon-13 spectra. One thing the carbon-13 spectrum would have told us, for example, is that there's likely a carboxylic acid functional group in this molecule, and this peak way out at 12, which integrates to 1, is a big indicator of that. 2H and 2H in the aromatic region tells us that we've got a substituted aromatic ring in a para-substitution pattern with two distinct groups of protons. There's the rest of our degrees of unsaturation. We can use the coupling properties and coupling constants and even two-dimensional spectra to sort out the alkyl region and identify specific alkyl groups. And I won't go into this in too much detail here, except to say that what we can glean from this, for example, is that there should be an isobutyl group within the structure somewhere and a methyl group connected to a methine somewhere in the structure as well. The final step is to assemble these fragments into all possible structures and then to rule out the structures by comparing them against the NMR spectra once more. For example, one thing we want to avoid is connecting the isobutyl group directly to this methine since that would imply coupling between the two hydrogens here and the one hydrogen here. But I really like this example because there are multiple possibilities that we could generate from these fragments alone. For example, without doing more rigorous analysis, it's not entirely clear whether the carboxylic acid group is directly connected to the aromatic ring or not. This actually leaves us in a pickle when we think this through because this would imply then that the methine connected to the CH3 and the isobutyl group must be connected to each other on the other side of the molecule, and that's inconsistent with the coupling pattern observed in the proton NMR spectrum. This is what's meant by comparing against those NMR spectra. Never forget that those coupling patterns need to reflect your proposed structure rigorously. Instead of going that route, then, it's clear that we need to put the methine and the isobutyl groups on opposite sides of the aromatic ring, with the methine connected to the carboxylic acid group. Not only is this consistent with the coupling pattern that we observed in the NMR spectra, but it also makes sense in a chemical shift sense, as this methine proton is relatively de-shielded as the alkyl protons go, and that makes sense being next door to the carboxylic acid group. In fact, this is the structure of the molecule that we've looked at here, and it's ibuprofen. The structure itself is not so important. The main thing to keep in mind is the process. And so let's review that once more. First, if the molecular formula isn't provided, use mass spectrometry or isotopic abundances to determine the molecular formula. Calculate degrees of unsaturation using this formula, and start to generate some candidate structures based on degrees of unsaturation, especially if it's very high, suggesting the presence of an aromatic ring. Next, use the infrared, proton NMR, and carbon-13 NMR spectra to identify functional groups, including specific alkyl chains based on coupling and integration. We didn't use the carbon-13 NMR spectrum directly in this example, but this reinforces everything that we found in the infrared and proton NMR spectra. And finally, assemble the fragments you've generated into all possible structures and rule out impossible structures by comparing them against the NMR spectra one more time. Throughout the process, Take really good notes, and remember to keep your mind flexible. You're going to have fits and starts with this. It's not going to work perfectly the first time, and that's okay. 
Treat each little bit of information that you pull from Spectra as a little victory when it comes to solving structure determination problems. Trust me, take it from somebody who has struggled with spectroscopy throughout my entire time as a chemist. This is a challenging process that really demands you to think probabilistically, think outside the box, and keep your thinking well organized.